tengo que cerrar, ¿no? Sí. Let's see how much you understand. Yes. You can ask any question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm Karthik. I'm a PhD student at FICAM. Uh, today I will be presenting my recent work titled Efficient Learning of Minimax Risk Classifiers in High Dimensions. Um, so in this talk, I will be presenting an efficient learning algorithm for MRCs that is based on that is based on constraint generation methods uh, in LPs, linear programs. If you guys have any idea, so I will be using such methods to make the learning of, of MRCs efficient in considering the high dimensional settings. So what is high dimensional settings? In supervised classification, you uh, use training samples, training instance, instance label pairs X and Y to learn the classification rule H. In, in regular setting, the data looks something like this. You have N instances and each instance has its corresponding label Y. Um, and each instance has a length, is a vector of length b. That is, each instance has the dimensions. In regular data, all the dimensions of the data x are important for classification. But in high dimensional settings, the, the number of dimensions of each training instance uh, becomes quite large. It can be in the order of tens of thousands and the number of samples, instances that are available for training can be limited and can be a few hundreds. So for instance, a very classical example is genomics. In genomics, a typical classification problem can be classifying whether a patient is, has cancer or not based on his gene expression. And those gene expressions can be very large and the number of available patients in general are limited, are a few hundreds. So when you have such kind of data, um, in general, most of the dimensions of that data are not required. As you can see in this figure, only a few dimensions are of the data that is represented by the green lines are important for the classification. So this shows that efficient learning can be achieved using less number of dimensions. Because so what happens first in high dimensional data? The challenges can be there are multiple challenges. The first one is that the learning the classification rules with such large number of dimensions it can be complicated, can, can require a lot of time because the number of variables involved in the optimization increase with the number of dimensions of the data. So when you have large number of dimensions, it will, the training time of the data increases as you can see in this curve, which is an example of SVMs. So in addition to the large training times, you also, in such scenarios, scenarios, you have less number of training samples. So the conventional error estimation based on cross validation can be unreliable due to large variability in the error. As you can see in this figure, uh, when you have few samples, the variability in the error is very large, which can be Okay, can, can be the mean where the mean of this error can be unreliable and you need a lot of samples to have better estimation. So uh, for now there are multiple methods, multiple efficient learning algorithms for different different methods in supervised classification are there. Recently um, uh, methods based on constraint generation have been proposed for L1 regularized MRCs, uh, L1 regular, regularized SVMs. 
and these methods can be useful in the high dimensional settings as we have seen earlier but the conventional performance assessment of the supervised classification rules is generally based on cross-validation and that can be unreliable as we have seen earlier so in this talk i will be presenting efficient learning algorithm for 0 1 minimax risk classifiers mrcs for the high dimensional settings based on constraint generation techniques um, as a result of the algorithm it provides a greedy feature selection that can be utilized to select the, the important features in such large number of dimensions and also our algorithm provides performance assessment at learning which can be utilized apart from the cross validation so in the following presentation i will first talk about the mrcs the problem statement the optimization problem at hand and then present the efficient learning algorithm that can be used to solve this problem efficiently in high dimensional settings and then i will present some theoretical properties of this uh, algorithm such as uh, the performance assessment at learning and other properties and finally we will do the sensitivity analysis of the algorithm based on the hyperparameters and also we will show using multiple high dimensional data sets the efficiency improvement and the effective feature selection of the presented algorithm so what's minimax risk classifiers so first let's let's talk about talk about the general supervised classification objective so in supervised classification you try to minimize the classification risk rh that is the expected loss uh, using the true underlying distributions over the training samples x and y so the problem that happens in general is that you never know the true underlying distribution over the training samples that is you don't know how the samples can occur so the usual approach in supervised classification is to is do the empirical risk minimization so empirical risk minimization utilizes the empirical distribution over the training samples and minimizes this loss common methods utilizing this approach are support vector machines logistic regression and many other so in such scenarios in, in, in those algorithms those classifiers use uh, losses such as hinge loss and other log loss which are surrogates to the natural classification loss that is zero one so the most natural classification loss is that if you have predicted something correctly you say z one uh, you say zero error and if you have predicted something wrong you would say one that's the zero one classification loss but the conventional methods such as support vector machines and logistic regressions they 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 don't they can't use this loss due to computational issues so minimax risk classifiers use a different approach to the to the usual approach of empirical risk minimization so they use robust risk minimization that is they utilize a set of distribution instead of the empirical distribution to to minimize the expected loss over the training samples the mr the uncertainty set of distributions for mrcs is given by this uh, condition this constraint that is they use uh, the expectation of a feature mapping over training samples um, and that should lie inside the interval the expectation should lie inside this interval where tau is given by the training samples and the expectation of the train of the feature mapping over training samples and lambda is the variance in the tau so um uh, uh, so here uh, using these values 
MRCs can guarantee with high probability uh, the, that the true underlying distribution lies in this set. Moreover, here, as you can see, that the problem that we had was that the D was very large, the number of dimensions in the data was very, lar very, very large. So since here we use feature mappings that transform X, the data to uh, dimension M, in general, such transformations may increase the dimensionality. One of the most common way of doing, feature, most common feature mapping is one hot encoding, where the M is D times the number of classes. So the, uh, the number of features, that is M, becomes very large also. And also, I would like to point out that MRCs can also utilize zero one can utilize the natural zero one classification loss, mm -hmm. uh, which was not possible using the other techniques. So using zero one loss, the MRC's classification rule is given as the product between the features and mu star, uh, where mu star is the solution of this convex L1 regularized problem. So as you can see, the problem we have here is this, uh, this convex optimization problem with M variables. As we said, M is very large. So you have an optimization problem with large number of variables, which can be inefficient. So to make this efficient, if we would first to make this learning efficient, we would first transform the training, uh, the this optimization problem to a uh, linear program, and then we'll present the efficient learning algorithm that can do efficient learning in high dimensions. So this problem can be transformed to this linear program by changing the variables mu to mu1 and mu2. And the matrix F is given by the features, feature mapping over the training samples. And so in this case, you can see the matrix, so the matrix F is of size M. Uh, it has a number like M columns and the problem has M variables. So it's again very complex. This problem can be transformed to a dual problem, to its corresponding dual using the primal dual relationship in LP. So here, the number of variables in the primal become the number of constraints in the dual. So since we have large number of variables in primal, we have large number of constraints in the dual. So now we will try to optimize this problem in looking at the perspective of dual uh, in high dimensions. So what happens? to the dual problem in high dimensions. So in high dimensions, you have a lot of constraints since you have a lot of variables in the primal. So for instance, the problem on the right can be represented as the problem on the left. It can be visualized as the problem on the left. So you can see you have a lot of constraints. The black lines represent the constraints. And the red line represents the objective value, uh, the objective function. So you're trying to maximize the objective function over this, this uh, feasible region. So your maximum point is alpha star r star here on this region. Now, can you solve this problem very efficiently? Yes. Do you need all these constraints? No. You can remove most of these constraints and the problem, the optimal value still remains the same. So if I remove all those redundant features slash constraints, the optimal value just using these two constraints still remains the same. So this shows that in high dimensions, you have a lot of uh, un unrequired dimensions or features that you can remove and efficient learning can be achieved. So how to achieve this efficient learning? We will discuss this in the, in the next sections. So the efficient learning algorithm. 
So the algorithm, so let's look, let's consider the problem that we were looking at first again. So this was the problem, uh, the original problem. So the algorithm, instead of taking all the, all the constraints, starts with very few constraints, which are, which can be selected randomly. So the, let's say in this example, the algorithm selects these, the three dark black lines and the optimal value um, lies here for this selected set of constraints. So since we have selected few constraints, this optimization uh, problem will not take long. It will be really efficient. So uh, this is an iterative algorithm. So it will now check at this iteration is my optimal value the inside the if my current optimal value is inside the visible region no it is not so how to check that the algorithm checks for the violated constraints so as you can see uh, these two constraints are violating uh, the current solution is violating these two constraints so the algorithm now knows that you are violating some constraints so the algorithm will select the constraint that is most violated to have the maximum decrease in the objective value that is our worst case error. So, on so in this case, we will select the this constraint. In addition, in this problem, you can see that uh, as we proceed, some of the constraints become redundant. So, for instance. Removing this constraint doesn't change the objective value. So the algorithm also removes the constraints that are not required at each iteration. So doing these selection of constraints and removal of constraints, our next problem, the updated problem, because becomes this. So as you can see, our objective value are one to drop to uh, the R1 dropped to R2. That is the our worst case error is decreasing. And the objective value, however, the optimal value is still not inside the uh, feasible region. So this iterative process keeps on continuing. And then you, in this case, for instance, the algorithm will again check for the violated constraints, which is this and the redundant constraints, which is this. And repeating this again, the algorithm ends up in the optimal value. So as you can see, at the end, we have selected the two required constraints to reach the optimal. So what's the stopping criteria for the algorithm? So it checks if my current solution is inside the feasible region we are we are at the end so we have, we have finished so how do you check if you are in the feasible region you check if there are any constraints that are violated since in this case all the constraints are satisfied and we have achieved the optimal value so this is our final optimal value uh, yeah you have a question yeah, sure. so there is no error now i mean it's error free right uh, what do you mean error? Uh, because you are you are minimizing something or uh, some uh, constraint uh, and you are checking how much error is coming, right? Right. And uh, then at this point, uh, you you have I mean, on the lower level of error. So at this point, there is no error. No, no, no. So the uh, R, R, you mean the R? Yeah. Yeah. So the R presents the worst case error of the classification. Oh, oh. So. In this case, you are not zero, but you are at the optimal, the okay. optimal worst case error you can get. Uh, that's what I mean. It's a lower limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the okay. best you can get, you okay. get at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we are now at the optimal worst case error, and the optimal solution is alpha star, and this is our stopping criteria. So now the algorithm stops. So yeah. This, in this slide, we'll represent the, a short implementation of the algorithm. So the selection and removal of the constraints, as we said, is done by the select function uh, that is defined in our paper. So the, the 
the uh, the the algorithm proceeds first with the initial set of features and then does the selection and in this while loop does the iterative process until the condition that we mentioned earlier that is no constraint is violated is satisfied in addition we have some other hyperparameters in this implementation that is uh, for instance i is the initial set of features that you that you can tell the algorithm to select uh, epsilon is the violation how much violation do you allow in the dual constraints that we saw in a brief i would explain that epsilon in much more detail kmax is the number of iterations of the algorithm so the maximum allowed number the maximum number of iterations that you allow for the algorithm so you can also control that in our implementation and also we do select we have restrict the number of constraints that are select in, in the previous example i selected only one constraint but in the original implementation we do select multiple constraints to converge much faster so nmax controls the number of constraints that you select in each iteration so in the next i will yeah so the complex computational complexity of the algorithm depends on the hyperparameters that we discussed right now so for instance if you select too many constraints in each iteration you would end up in less number of iterations because you're selecting too many but since you're selecting too many your comp computational complexity per iteration increases so and max gives you kind of a trade-off between the complexity per iteration and the number of iterations and in apart from that epsilon epsilon is the dual constraint violation uh, the max the allowed dual constraint violation so for instance in this in the example that we had earlier so if my epsilon is this big i won't select this uh, constraint this constraint is now not considered as violation because so this was my feasible region this was the current optimal value and this is the original the the best optimal value that i can get but since i have my epsilon very big i won't select this constraint so my algorithm will finish at this point in the previous example that i explained uh in that case you can consider that i was using epsilon zero since i was not using any uh, threshold so so what happens with this epsilon so if you use very big epsilon you would select less number of constraints so again the complexity per iteration will go down and also since you select if you make this really big you are going to end up earlier you will, your algorithm will terminate earlier that 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 implies that your number of iterations will also decrease so if you do that uh, so you might think like let's increase epsilon a lot so the complexity this and this uh, the number of iterations and the complexity per iteration will decrease which are the main main components that that govern the computation complexity of our algorithm so if you take really large epsilon the computational complexity will go down but you will end up in a solution that's not the best because the best was here because in this case if i if i increase the epsilon i'm not going to select this constraint apart from this no constraint is violated so the so my algorithm ends up here which is suboptimal but not the optimal the best optimal uh, value that we want so epsilon gives you a trade-off between between the computational complexity and the approximation error so in the following we will show some theoretical results based on epsilon and also the worst case error, decreasing worst case error as you pointed out so so first theorem uh, shows that the worst case error of the classifier decreases 
uh, as is monotonic, monotonically decreasing along the iterations of the algorithm. So, uh, for instance, if mu if mu k and r k are the solution at each iteration k of the algorithm for a given for a selected set of constraints slash features then the classification rule h k that can be given by mu k uh, has a error probability this r h k and r h k is bounded by the worst case error probability r k that we had in the algorithm at each iteration so at each, it, 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 at each iteration you are getting a mrc classifier hk whose error probability or the classification risk of that classifier is bounded by the worst case error probability rk obtained at that iteration plus the difference with uh, the, the plus the difference in the expectation of the uh, between the true expectation and the estimated expectation so in simple terms if if your true expectation if your expectation lies in the true is in this interval if the true expectation lies in the interval of tau and j this becomes zero so you basically have that rk can give you the upper bound on the worst on the classification risk uh, at learning and this uh, worst case error probability is also decreasing along the iterations as given by the proof of this algorithm, this theorem apart from that um, we also show the next theorem that we present the next theorem that shows the convergence of the solution uh, of our algorithm to the optimal uh, the best possible, the original solution using all the variables so for instance uh, so in this case let's say mu star and r star is the solution obtained using all the features that is the exact solution <clears throat> and let's say rk is the solution obtained by our algorithm at each iteration so at some point for some k naught our rk the solution it, it lies in the interval of r star plus r star in the interval r star to r star plus some epsilon times the <clears throat> solution true solution so here you can see if your epsilon is bigger your interval gets bigger so that means your optimal value rk is is not close can be very far from the original true opt the op true optimal value r star so increase uh, again as we said increasing epsilon can decrease the computation complexity but at the cost of achieving less approximate error so yeah these theorems are presented in our paper you can check for the proofs uh, later so now in the following section we will present some results to, to show the efficiency and sensitivity analysis of the algorithm so first let's do the sensitivity analysis of the algorithm based on the hyperparameters that we set up silent and, and max so this figure uh, is uh, so this in this figure we are showing uh, the working of our algorithm over a high dimensional biological data set which has like uh, 10 10000 features or more so as you can see that uh, the x-axis represents the number of iterations of our algorithm and the uh, y-axis represents the approximation error of our algorithm. So as our theorem 2 before said that the error, the worst case error is decreasing monotonically uh, can be seen in this figure. Uh, so as you can see for dif different values of epsilon the algorithm the worst case error given by the iterative algorithm decreases at each iteration so in practice uh, we see that in 20 iterations our algorithm achieves a really good approximation error in the order of 10 to the power minus 4 or 5 and 
for values of epsilon 10 to the power minus 4, we achieve really good accuracy. And in this, this setting, we used nmax is equal to 100, uh, which can be seen from this other figure that shows the, 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 the time taken by our algorithm with respect to the time taken by solving all the uh, solving using all the features. So the relative time represents the time taken by our algorithm div divided by time taken by solving the LP using all the M features. So as you can see, for multiple data sets, uh, we achieve almost uh, this would be like 20 percent, 20 percent, 10. That, yeah, we are like twice faster than the original uh, than the original way of solving the optimization, and in most of the cases we are much faster and we achieve uh, better results for n max is equals to hundred when we select like hundred features at each iteration. Um, so uh, also one interesting thing is that. The iterative algorithm gives you a trade-off between training time and accuracy. So I can stop the algorithm earlier if I want to minimize the time, but I would I, I would still stopping earlier, I would still get an MRCS classification rule at hand, but with less accuracy. But I would save a lot of time. So the our algorithm can provide a trade-off between the time and accuracy. So in the next section, now we will show some, from now on, we will show some numerical results using multiple biological data sets, which have huge number of features. Uh, most of these data sets have more than 10,000, at least the minimum uh, uh, number of features is 10,000 and more. So on the left, uh, we show this figure, uh, a comparison between the training time of different algorithms. So we compare the uh, MRCCG is our algorithm. MRCLP is the is solving the MRC problem using all the features. And SVMCG is the constraint generation method for SVMs. So as you can see in this figure, the training time, the, the training increase in the training time as the number of features increase. So as you can see, the yellow curve MRCLP increases exponentially, but our algorithm, that is the blue curve, increases almost, we cannot say linearly, but we don't have a proof, but you can say it's uh, linear from the curve, from the figure. So it's much more efficient as you can see from the yellow one. And also we are comparable to the SVM's constraint generation method. So overall, we achieve significant efficiency in our uh, for the MRCs using our approach. In addition, we show we have, we provide worst case error probabilities for the classification rule of the MRC classification rule, which can serve as an alternative to the cross validation error that we discussed in the first slide. So as you can see, the problem in the cross-validation errors that you have a large variance. So for instance, in this case, 30% of error has a 10% of variation. So that is really unreliable, but we provide worst, the worst case error probability, which can be upper bound to the true error as given by the bold uh, numbers. The bold numbers represent that the our a worst case error probably uh, provides an upper bound to the classification error. In most cases, the upper bound, the worst case error probability is an upper bound. And in the other cases, it still lies in the interval of the error, a cross validated error. So, yeah, these are obtained using multiple high dimensional data sets. Uh, most of them are binary, binary and some of them are multi-class. In multi-class, you have la even large number of features. So you can 
see here the training time comparisons also for uh, our algorithm and SVMs. We are quite competitive in terms of training time and in addition we provide the worst case error at training. Uh, also a good thing about our algorithm it provides a feature selection approach too. It can be utilized as a feature selection method. So we come in this table we show the comparison of our algorithm as a feature selection approach with other algorithms such as SVM CG that we saw right now and these two are some of the state some state of the art feature selection techniques uh, RFEs and MRR so we can s we 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 here we show the errors of using the features selected by our algorithm and the other algorithms over uh, different classification uh, over the classification rules logistic regression and decision trees so we can see that using our algorithm this feature selected the error for the logistic regression and decision tree uh, based on the feature selected by our algorithm is quite competitive with the other feature selection techniques and the number of features you can see selected by our algorithm is quite low uh, in for these data sets in, rea in uh, the original number of features were some tens of thousands but our algorithm selects a few hundreds so we are we select very less features and we are we provide state-of-the-art results for feature selection so the approach can be used as a feature selection algorithm too so um, let's conclude what we get from this presentation um, the presentation in this presentation we present we discussed about an efficient learning algorithm for a super for zero one mini max risk classifiers uh, considering the high dimensional settings and the iterative algorithm provided a sequence of MRCs uh, uh, with decreasing worst case error probabilities for which we also have a theorem. The, pro the presented algorithm can be utilized uh, to can, can provide performance assessment at learning without requiring the cross validation error that can be really as useful for the scenarios that we discussed earlier. In overall, so we have, we sh we achieve using numerical results. We should we observe that we achieve quite good efficiency. We converge in few iterations, and we can provide worst case error probability at learning, which can serve as an upper bound to the classification risk. And we can use that as an alternative to the cross validation. So here are the reference. Here are the references. The first one is the paper of uh, the constraint generation for SVMs. Uh, the second one is the paper for MRCs. You can check out more details about MRCs in this paper. The third one is a paper about that, sh that shows the challenges in the set scenarios of genomics, uh, about the challenges give, uh, faced by using cross-validation in the genomics areas when you have limited number of samples. And finally, uh, this one is the paper uh, that I'm presenting in UAI. Uh, so yeah, this in this paper, I present the efficient learning algorithm for MRCs. Uh, the code for the algorithm can be found here. Uh, if you guys want to use it, you can scan this and you can go and check out. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you for your time. So nobody has no questions. Or nobody understands. Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. you, you, you use the, uh, some data. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, a big data any right, data right. you have, and you can use this. Most of them are like data. biological data sets. Very biological data sets. But any data, if you have, you can use this algorithm, and you yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah, we show we in this case we showed application of 
biological biological any other data yeah yeah any other data yeah yeah no, that's fine so it's good thank you so yeah, i'm just asking in the chat if anyone has some yeah. questions Yeah, thanks again. Yeah.